Hi, thanks everyone for coming. It's not only my stage, it's also <laughs> the stage of Hera Hussein, Ellen Emke and Michelle Thorne. Thanks for joining me. I'm going to introduce them in a bit. Um, yeah, we're super happy that there's a full room. We're going to do 45 minutes of discussion and then we'll have 15 minutes for your questions at the end. So write them down and um, yeah, think about some questions that you would like to ask the panelists. Stellar panel of researchers, community organizers, activists. Um, so good choice to come to this session. Before we start and before I introduce every one of the panelists, I wanted to give you a brief introduction um, to the headline and to the title and to the panel. So our session starts with the word sorry, but we are not here to apologize, which is important. Um, quite the contrary, actually. We're here to talk about and to celebrate the change that families have been pushing for in the digital sphere for many, many years. Activists around the globe have been putting, have been working to bring feminist values like collaboration, care, equity to the center of technology development and to make sure that the power of the big tech gets disrupted and changed. Their visions are guiding lights that can, that can guide us into better digital futures. And the feminist reply is not late. It has been, the replies have been here all along and the feminists and the replies of the feminists have helped to push for change in many areas. Feminist hackers, technologists, advocacy and tech policy experts have been at the forefront of new developments. Let me give you a recent example because I figured it might be nice to, to start with an example. I'm sure many of you have been following the news about the leaked draft of the Supreme Court in the US to overturn abortion rights. It's in the media everywhere and like Poland, neighboring country of Germany also had some um, changes in their policies. And digital rights activists and feminists have been warning since years that surveillance made possible by minimally regulated digital technologies could help law enforcement to track down women who might seek abortions. Data collected by period tracking apps, for example. Some feminist hackers have started to build their own privacy protecting open source period trackers. There's one project from Berlin called Drip who started years ago when everyone was like, why do we need another period tracking app to work on an app that stores the data on your phone um, that is open source and that uh, doesn't come with a pink heteronormative design. So they started to work on it years ago and basically made sure that we now have the tools we need when times are changing um, into a different political um, direction. So this is just one example of the pioneering work that many feminists in the space have been doing. We're all standing on the shoulders of many giantesses before us and we want to celebrate their heritage today, but we also want to talk about what we're working on um, today and how the people that came before us inspired us to do this work. Our feminism is intersectional. It acknowledges that oppression does not exist in silos. Different systems of oppression, including patriarchy, racism, socioeconomic inequality, and more intersect and shape the world we live in. And they also shape the experiences that each and, indiv each and individual uh, experience within it. While in the early days of the internet in the 90s, some of you might remember the cyber feminist movements, there was a lot of hope and a lot of optimism that this new medium um, would automatically contribute to governance beyond patriarchy, this new medium that was decentralized, that connected the whole world. Um, but when we look at technology today, we see that this optimism is not necessarily true or like the visions have not become reality, but um, that the uh, world that we're viewing is far from picture perfect. So t technology has brought many opportunities, efficiencies and innovations, but it, at the same time it has also entrenched inequalities and polarized political and civic debate. It has also created a myriad of new harms that we're going to talk about today, such as the environmental and climate impacts of technology or the use of new platforms to perpetuate abuse and violence. 
In the next 45 minutes, we're going to dive a little deeper into the topics, but I figured it would be interesting to maybe start out by giving you this short input and intro to the topic. Um, before I'll introduce all the panelists, I've just mentioned the 90s and early internet days. I'm curious to hear from you, um, to start out with a positive note, like, first experiences online, like, um, how was it? Like, what are the positive stories from back then, like being connected to the world from your childhood room? Do you want to start, Michelle? Sure. Um, well, in the 90s, I was really obsessed with Xena Warrior Princess. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I would lo I lo my first experience was logging into a chat room, like a Xena fan uh, chat room, and someone on the other end saying, I'm Lucy Lawless, the actress. I'm writing to you from New Zealand. And I was, I don't know how old I was. I was dumb and naive, but that, even though it wasn't true, I learned later that it wasn't true, that um, it felt the possibility of connecting around something such like a fan thing to connect with, and the possibility, even though it wasn't the real actress, to talk to somebody <laughs> that made something that you liked was a really, was a really cool experience online. So there, there's a 90s uh, okay, throwback. Cool, cool. <laughs> Kara, what about you? I loved reading so much as a child, um, and this is going to surprise no one who knows me. I uh, was a very n big, big child nerd, loved computers. So my favorite thing was Project Gothenburg, which basically uploaded books, and I could just read all English classics. I was really into English literature. Um, and also Britannia. Does anybody remember Britannica? Like, before Wikipedia, I was just <laughs> spending hours and hours on it. I got obsessed with trying to develop a sixth sense. I thought that was possible. I could make things move with my eyes. I downloaded a 500-page PDF. <laughs> I really tried. It didn't work. So I was like, OK, I need some other sixth sense. Then I learned how to speed read, actually. So yeah, I, my, my favorite time was just looking at like books and just like for free, which you know were expensive to buy, and, and just, just getting everything that I could on English literature. Cool. Um, like the first thing when you asked was that I thought about how slow the experience was and that it was connected to this beeping sound and uh, the page appearing bit by bit and bite by bite that this was something you could still literally see and I remember that like having my first email address saved me from receiving midnight faxes that my school student union friends used to send and my parents were super annoyed with and so I think it was really also about having these new opportunities to connect to, to people that I did activism with and to share things like on the spot rather than, you know, receiving faxes uh, in the middle of the night. Thanks. Thanks for sharing your experiences. This is my favorite panel kickoff question, <laughs> by the way. Um, but now I'd like to start by introducing Hera Hussein to you. So I'm going to introduce every speaker, not all at once, because otherwise it's 15 minutes of introduction. But I'll introduce Hera and then ask her some questions, and I'll do the same with the other two. So Hera actually had the longest trip of all the panelists. She um, is based in London, and Hera is the CEO and founder of a nonprofit called Chen, based in London as well and around the globe. You can tell us about that in just a second. And Hera can look back at the long history as an activist. I remember meeting you for the first time 10 years ago when you were still with Open Corporates. And uh, Hera started her nonprofit while working full time. So you started it as a side project nine years ago. So next year is the big uh, anniversary. And Chen, and there are some team members here, right? Naomi is sitting over there. Yeah. Um, anyone else from Chen here? No. Ah, yeah, over there. Cool, Dama. Um, and Chen is working with survivors and allies around the globe. They create online resources for survivors of gender based violence. Among them are digital trauma relief programs that they developed during COVID, for example, and they've also just recently teamed up with the dating app Bumble um, to grow their, um, to expand the scope of um, their impact. Um, yeah, welcome Hera, and um, we're going to talk about feminist approaches today, about just and equal digital futures. So maybe just briefly, what's your background and what perspective are you bringing to this panel and discussion today? What a great question to start with. Um, I, my background is actually quite similar to Julia's. We know each other from the open data, open source movement. That's where I started my career. I was really, really invested in uh, sort of 
uh, projects like Wikipedia and like how we can really share more and hoard less. So that's where my uh, like passion was. I worked in anti-corruption, but you know, being a woman and uh, experiencing like moving through the world as a woman is quite a learning experience. And I always wanted to do something about uh, gender-based violence. And it's just, I was just really lucky uh, that I just managed to sort of, I was like, I really care about like gender justice. I really care about open source. <laughs> so I just put those two together and I was like, I'm going to be able to fight gender-based violence and really support survivors healing but I do I want to live those feminist values so I'm big on living feminist values and one of the big ones is collaboration is openness is holding space for multiple viewpoints it's holding space for equality not just about gender but other forms of equality so I try to live these values not just in the work that, that I do but also in the way that I lead the team in the way that I build the organization in the way that I share resources and share struggles of running the organization so I really try to run my life as a feminist experiment. That's it. And yeah, <laughs> great. Uh, so humble. <laughs> yeah, and Hera is really walking the talk. When you go to the uh, Chen website and to the blog posts, you can read up about on how you hire, right? Your hiring practice. My worst decisions. You can read all of them. <laughs> <laughs> They're all available for all of you to see. Um, so yeah, I, I, I try to like share like what is, is it actually like? Because you know, feminism is not a goalpost. It's not like a destination. You're learning all the time and unlearning because you're enmeshed in patriarchy and none of us are you know, completely aware of all social issues. Uh, and, I, and I'm just another imperfect uh, feminist, but I just, I, I happen to have power and I happen to create space. So that means that I can hold myself accountable, but also learn in the, in the open. So I wish more people did that, but you know, it's, it's easy to wish and, and, you know, harder to do. So I'm doing and hoping that more people join me in that. Ah, and you've just recently published, I think Naomi presented it the other day here at Republica as well, a guide called Orbits. Um, and it's a field guide to advance survivor-centered, trauma-informed interventions to technology-facilitated gender-based violence. So that's a long <laughs> subtitle. Um, can you unpack it's, that? It's on purpose. It's oh, okay. to make sure people are ready to read the 100-page document. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if you can't get through the title, you're not going to read the document. So it's like for the girls who are really committed. Yeah, and it's actually funded by Robert Bosch of Dung, who are here with us today as well. So yeah, it's um, the field guide is about uh, looking at three critical areas, uh, which we think are research, it's uh, technology, so the technology development, uh, and also policy. Mm -hmm. So we look at those three areas and we present, we first look at how are those, uh, in the way that we run uh, tech spaces, how are we looking at gender-based violence? Um, are, is that survivor-centered? Uh, is it trauma-informed? So is it really thinking about how people experience trauma? And are we responding to that? Um, and the answer is no. It's not surprising. And we go into, well, what could that look like? And we give examples, not just from our work, but from you know, many, many amazing organizations, a lot of whom are actually at Republica and, and in other parts of the world. So we truly look at a global picture and try to Bring, bring together not just best practices but also open questions because this is the kind of work you know we really tried really hard to find good examples of policy for example you know which governments are doing really good work on tackling gender-based violence online and there are not that many examples so you know where we didn't find them we said that and then presented ideas for what that could be can you give us an example for a trauma-centered approach yeah, so it, I mean, it, when we apply a trauma uh, center or inform, there are different phrases uh, for it to research, for example, then it looks like, you know, how are we gathering data? What does that process look like of, of researching trauma? Um, what are the support that you're providing someone who's experienced? Because re traumatization is something that is a given, it will happen to someone at some point. You can't eliminate it, but you can try your best to reduce the chances of it. In a, in a tech setting, you know, a trauma informed approach would be, are we really baking safety into the design of online spaces? Or are we putting that as an afterthought? Example being Twitter. Twitter, um, you know, had years of, of women saying, uh, especially black women saying, allow us to mute certain words, allow us to set ways in which we can, um, you know, uh, limit who can reply to our tweets. And Twitter said, no, can't do, too hard. Mm. And then 
on, when they had like a really big scandal, again, at the expense of uh, the trauma of a black woman who was a celebrity, they did it. So it's not like they couldn't do it. They did it pretty quickly. So it's this that a trauma-informed approach would have been at all those years of those requests for them to listen to that and not just listen to it, but actually have those kind of perspectives embedded in their team and have power within the team to make those calls. So that's what it would look like in, in a tech setting. Thanks. Let's bring another pan panelist into the discussion, Michelle Soren. Um, throughout her career, Michelle has been part of many movements, the Maker Movement, the MossFest, Mozilla Festival community, what other communities? Um, the Creative, Creative Commons Creative community, <laughs> the Open community. And uh, today she's one of the leading thinkers when it comes to bringing together sustainability and technology. In her work as sustainable internet lead at the Mozilla Foundation and at the Green Web Foundation, she centers on climate justice and a fossil free internet. We'll talk about that in a minute, what that means. Michelle also publishes a pretty cool magazine called branch that received an award at Ars Electronica last year. So there's many great stories around sustainability and tech that you can find there. It's the third edition is out, right? Yes. Cool. Um, so in your work, when I say the internet and uh, the climate crisis, you're bringing together like pretty complex, um, difficult topics. How does a feminist perspective help you to unpack the complexity of the topics? Yes, <laughs> um, I think similar to maybe to Hera, I was also going, you know, worked, working in the free and open space and for the internet, it was like, this is a big transformative system and we also have a planet that's on fire and there's these feelings of like, okay, these two really complex and important, the uh, planet is personally important, I'm probably also important to you all too, this feeling of how do we bring this, the possibility of the internet and the, the connectivity and stuff that it brings, the access to knowledge, and participation, but also with an accountability to the planet. Um, I guess that's been the last few few years praying, like how do you talk about those things together? And I think the awesome thing about feminism, and I, I would say I'm a late appreciator of feminism, I have benefited a lot from the feminists who came before, but only more recently said, like I need to be also a more active feminist and kind of evolve my feminism. Um, is the realization of, I think also similar to your saying here, is that actually women have been at the forefront of a lot of the climate movements. They have also been very vulnerable and have um, faced a lot of you know, barriers and challenges and stuff like that, that I think there's this opportunity as people who've worked in the open movement and the digital rights movement to actually say, we have techniques around you know, security or regulation or strategic litigation or just building open alternatives that could be in service to the climate movement and to especially to the feminists who are leaders in the climate space. So that's a little bit some of the <laughs> ways I'm trying to fit those together. Um, and I'm also, I mean, I'm, I'm someone who came more from the tech and open scene, as I mentioned, and so I'm really learning a lot about the climate crisis. There's a lot to learn. And one of the things I've learned is that you know, the climate impacts affect women, women and girls disproportionately. So if we improve the livelihoods and the situation of women and girls, we're going to have positive climate impacts and they're also more vulnerable to climate catastrophes. So there's a total connection between feminism and climate there as well. Um, so I don't know yes, if that could be... There's <laughs> also a connection to the topics that Hera just yeah. spoke about, right? Totally, around, yeah, I mean, I think digital security and, and online violence against women and organizers is like a huge, huge issue. We see that here in Germany, I mean, Luisa Neubaum speaking up, and right now, if you look at the reply she's getting on Twitter, from, she's a climate organizer here in Germany, it's terrible, really being, you know, death threats and worse. Um, so anyway, sorry, that we we're getting off into no, that. No, no. Um, and in your magazine, you read about the fact that the internet is the world's largest coal-powered machine um, and that it's becoming a brittle and polluting monoculture. And when we look at the tech companies like be it Meta, Apple, Google, we can read about how much they are doing to like use renewable energy, recycle their products, right? Like that's big in the media. And when you ask people from there, they will tell you exactly those stories that they're already doing a lot to like move towards like climate neutrality. Do you do you believe them? Like, is this a good sign that they're working on this? Or um, 
So yeah, so the so big tech is uh, moving big into greenwashing. Um, there's a lot, you know, <laughs> they they're very good at publishing, you know, amazing reports. Microsoft is like, we have this huge climate pledge that got a lot of publicity, but um, just one of the contracts, for example, Microsoft has with Big Oil, completely obliterates all of their emission savings that they're pledging to do. But they don't talk about it. Their con their business with Big Oil is like out of scope. Um, and so I think actually, as someone who's been working in the open space, we're seeing this kind of convergence of greenwashing and openwashing happening in the big tech sector and it bunks big oil. Um, Shell, for example, is um, stepping up, stepping up to say, hey, we're making all sorts of open source software that will help you measure your carbon footprint, blah, blah, blah. And then techies who go, we love open source and we want to measure our carbon footprints are grabbing these tools that Shell is making. Mm -hmm. And so there's a kind of... Um, as, as activists, we have to get more sophisticated in calling out both open washing and green washing because it's happening, yeah, it's happening now, yeah. Um, and the other thing about what's interesting about just in general having you know, been at Republica and been in places where we've been advocating for internet connectivity and, um, and um, equitable access to the internet, we haven't talked yet enough about the environmental impact of the internet itself. And again, that disproportionately is affecting women and girls and disproportionately affecting people in vulnerable communities. Um, and the internet is responsible for over 3% of the world's carbon emissions. That's more than the aviation industry, it's more than the shipping industry. And how can we as feminists and people who care about digital rights on the internet take into account its environmental impact while also advocating for like, these so, you know, open and sustainable alternatives. Um, yeah, because currently it's basically big tech is just selling, you're going to sell you business as usual powered by renewables. Mm -hmm. And we're going to still have the same digital rights issues. You know, Google's going green. They're, they're doing it. Actually, Google is probably one of the most sophisticated in terms of matching the energy consumption and data centers. Um, but then we're just going to be living on a Google cloud with all the digital rights issues we know about that. So how can we be transitioning the internet away from fossil fuels while advocating for a just and sustainable internet? And I think th that's a feminist question of our time. Cool. Thanks. <laughs> Let's move on to the third panelist, Ellen Emke. Ellen uh, works as a senior expert on equality, inequality for Robert Bosch Stiftung. Previously, she worked as an analyst on social inequality at Oxfam, Germany. And her scientific and political interests are inequality and socio-economical transformation from a global perspective. And in a recent program, and Hera has already mentioned it, Robert Bosch has uh, focused on reducing inequalities through intersectional practice. So this would also be my, my first question. I already said that the, our feminism here is intersectional. Um, why is it so important that we're talking about intersectionality and why did you focus on this in your program? Yeah, thank you um, for having me here. Um, and um, I, I come from the inequality space to the digital space, let's say for, uh, um, it's one of the first times or the first time to be at Republica. And I think that this um, link between these two fields is also something we um, explore in this panel. And within the feminist lens, why is a feminist and an intersectional lens so important? I think both of them are power sensitive approaches. Um, and like you said, that a feminism which only um, asks for white women to have, the, or, or for women to have the same jobs, the same wealth, and the same positions as men um, is not what we are asking for, because it would be as limiting as um, patriarchy was. And it's, um, if we think about the thinkers that have inspired us, Simone de Beauvoir, like a really early feminist, is that it's not about um, reproduce women having the same positions, emulating men, but creating a different power notion of power altogether. And for that, an intersectional approach, which acknowledges the differences we have, that we actually lead intersectional lives, meaning we experience um, marginalization, or many people on this planet experience marginalization in various ways, and to make that a starting point of our policies, rather than assuming that we are binary um, 
that has been a very important part of um, the inequality program when it was funded, and specifically this program on reducing um, inequality through intersectional practice. And a big shout out to my colleague Anna Dorothea Kras, who is here and who was actually leading most of the work on this, um, was to support organizations that already do that. Because one of the things that when the foundation established this program found was that a lot of offers made to civil society actually ask you to work on economic inequality, gender equality, um, but it doesn't often allow to explore these interlinkages. And we felt that this really is a, a gap and one that we hope to address in a, like, a very tiny way to allow organizations to explore exactly these overlaps rather than compartmentalizing their work into different boxes again. Yeah, and when we look at the digital, we're oftentimes just scratching the surface of inequalities, right? And um, at Oxfam, at Oxfam publishes this, uh, these inequality reports every year, um, or maybe even more often than uh, annually. Um, but there you look very closely at systemic factors. It's what, what are the underlying issues? Um, and I'm just curious to, to learn from you, what, what do you think are the factors that are exacerbating inequalities in the digital? So what are the underlying systemic factors that are influencing inequalities on a digital or in a tech field? Yeah, I think when you, in your opening statement, you already um, made like a, a very good remark about how initially, like when we take a step back and we look at the, the hopes that we ha that many had for the internet as a free, a much more free space, a space in which there could be equality to, um, and in which people would be allowed to express themselves freely, no matter where they come from, who their parents are, and so on. And what we have today, I think the, like, I think you understated it because the contrast couldn't be more stark. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have a system governed by a few white men uh, running these super hierarchical corporations that dominate actually the internet, a lot of what we buy, a lot of, um, but also our economies, our media. And so it shows that the, the digital and the analog, they're not like two different fields. And also if we want to analyze what causes inequality in the digital realm, we'll always have to look at what causes inequality in the analog realm if you want to separate them. Because it's the racism that has existed before that is now coded into AI. It's the misogyny that has existed before that is now in social media and causing exactly those harms that Hera has been talking about. And we also reproduce the, the inaccessibility like, like on a global scale, uh, recently, Aya Chebi, um, a feminist African activist who is um, one of our advisors, reminded us that a few years back, 71% of Africa was offline and uh, predominantly girls and women are offline. And so this whole questions of access to resources and um, the ability to express yourself freely did not come into the internet out of the blue, but out of the very same social and political systems where in, that we live in the analog. So that's the one thing. And on the other hand, we also have the digital and especially like some technologies of these behemoth companies that actually increase economic inequality in the analog world because we've seen that um, in many in most of the advanced economies, actually digitalization and automation has caused higher income inequality, maybe even higher wealth inequality. The data on that is maybe less um, conclusive, but we definitely see it on economic power of a few superstar firms. And so I would say if we look for the um, inequalities in the digital realm, we have to on the one side look at those in the analog realm and also understand that the digital realm is adding new layers of inequality in, in both. Mm -hmm. um, and in the end, we are living in digitalized societies, so I think it doesn't make sense to separate them so much. Um, and that maybe to end on a, on a note also calls for us to, to think about what have been the fights for 
um, greater justice in the analog world for which, from which we can learn in the digital. Because sometimes I feel like this is really also a deja vu that we have already fought for black bodies to be recognized as human bodies. Now we have to fight for black faces being recognized um, by automated um, facial recognition. We have fought for bodily integrity of women to be recognized in the analog world and abuse to be recognized. And now we have to do the same for the digital world. And so I think that we also have to learn from these fights in the analog world for the digital world. Thanks, yeah. So we've moved from the early days of the internet, the hopeful, enthusiastic days, to like problem analysis, very important. But I now want to shift gears and want to move into a space where we talk about what solutions do we have at hand already? Like what are, for example, what is a core feature that we, that a feminist internet would have to, to have? Here, if you wanna, wanna start, like what is a core feature that, um, that we need to build or maybe it's already there? I think agency um, is a big one for me, mm -hmm. which is uh, actually one of the principles, uh, design principles at Chen, and it's something that we also talk about in the Orbits report that uh, Julia mentioned. Um, and agency recognizes consent. It recognizes a person's you know, choice to be able to decide how they engage with resources, so whether it is is someone you know empowered enough to be able to build their own like micro community online? Yes, you know, are queer people in oppressive countries able to organize safely online? You know, um, that is like a core principle, right? Do they have that privacy? Do they have that agency? So I find the agency is probably one of my like like my best lenses when I look at like how do we create feminist internet? But collaboration as well. Are we as organizations working in this space? Are we working together? Mm -hmm. You know, like if we don't embody those values, like how do we create an internet that's collaborative if we don't collaborate to make it collaborative? You see, like there's like a, there's a problem there. So I think that agency is like a, like a really really critical. And I know we have been uh, talking with such hope uh, so far. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but my favorite one, another design principle that I have is hope uh, that we use in Chain because we find when you're working on something like gender-based violence, you know, someone ha that is the process of that kind of abuse is someone stripping you away your agency, you know, your, uh, you know, self-compassion, someone taking away your right to choose your life and hope. So everything that Chen does is about embedding hope in our, in our practice, in our words, in our images, in our, in our work, everything. Because the number one thing that survivors tell us when they come to us is that when I come to your resources, when I come to your website, when I talk to you, you give me hope. I feel like even if I can't escape my situation, I know that someone's out there that cares that I escape from my situation. Mm -hmm. Someone there knows I matter and someone somewhere else is escaping it. Mm -hmm. So that gives me hope to live. And I think that feeling is everything. And joy probably as well, right? Feminist joy and how can we yeah. start with joy and center around joy Absolutely. and knowing that there's so many things that are not working in our favor, not working in the favor of the, of the many. Um, and if a feminist internet is a fossil free internet, like what, a, it sounds like such a big vision. You, I think in branch, you mentioned that you're working, uh, that you're striving for a fossil free internet in 2030, right? Is that doable? Like what are steps that we need to take? What, how can we make that a reality? Um, so the UN secretary general was recently tweeting that we have, you know, less than 36 weeks to take like dramatic action Uh, for the climate and dramatically reduce emissions. And he's like, not 36 years and not 36 months, but 36 weeks. Um, and I think there's a sense of urgency, a, a feminist sense of urgency, which also acknowledges that while we need to act urgently, the solutions may be slow. Mm. And I think there's a feminist embracing of slow and of process that, does, that means we can move slowly, quickly um, on these issues. And so when I think about a fossil-free internet by 2030, we, we ha I mean, this, this is like we have to do these kinds of things. We have to set these ambitious goals of urgency um, and we have to hold the powers accountable to get off fossil fuels, divest from big tech, divest from big oil, and invest in sustainable and just alternatives. And we can do that slowly, quickly, 
Um, and I think that that's a motto, hopefully also try to bring, bring, bring into work that slowly, quickly, um, and also, yeah, bring, bring it with joy, bring it with fun, bring it with light, even in that seriousness, because we also are human. We have one precious life, and that I think it's also part of a radical feminist tradition to also say, we're going, you know, Tony Kane Babara, who's an amazing black feminist, wrote about make the revolution irresistible. Like, let's make this thing irresistible that we want to build and like build it, and that will give us momentum and purpose and, and beauty. I want to go back to the agency a little bit. So, because Naomi, we at Super, together with 25 collaborators, worked on feminist tech principles, 25 principles. And one was written uh, by Naomi and Elena, and it was around informed consent. So, do you want to speak a little bit about informed consent and how it can help us to gain agency in the digital space? What does it even mean, informed consent? And Yeah, it's a great, great question because I think in, uh, informed consent is one of those sort of phrases that both scare people who are practitioners who have to get consent. Um, and it is also, it is, uh, also like a really, like it's a goal that people, you know, people expect you to have when you're working in, in, in any, any space when you're working with vulnerable people. So the way I think about informed consent is that rather than thinking about You know, it is definitely a form of compliance. You have to comply with that. There's like laws around it. But putting that to aside, what we're really doing is we're giving someone, and this is why, like, for us, like, consent comes under agency, is you're some, giving someone the agency to be able to not just fully participate in a process where they feel empowered to ch to be themselves, um, and, but also to exit that process. So when working with survivors of gender-based violence, one of the aspects of any form of interpersonal violence, um, child abuse, any sort of, sort of that kind of experience that someone has, there's so much fear attached to conflict. So when you're working with someone who has that history, you, like, you want to reduce that conflict Uh, because they will do anything to reduce that conflict. So when you're trying to get informed consent, let's say you're you're asking someone to participate in a co-design workshop, just mm -hmm. give an example. Like you have to make, like you were saying, making the movement irresistible. You have to make the the process of exiting participation okay, not stressful. Mm -hmm. That it's part of it. That it's okay to disagree. That it's part of it. We want you to disagree. If you want to leave, that's completely fine. And it's reducing that pressure of like sticking to a process that doesn't feel right to someone and people can change their minds at any time. So in celebrating that, and that's the hardest thing to embody when you're working in a place because you're there to do a job. And I'm just talking about research setting because I think that's where most people know this. Um, in, a, in a legal practice, actually, like informed consent would look different because most laws around uh, uh, assault, gender-based violence, a focus around survivor, like the the perpetrator's intentions, which is very important, of course, but it doesn't focus equally enough on, on consent and like the lack of consent. So this is something we go into the Orbitz uh, guide as well. So someone shares an intimate image of someone without the consent of the person who, who, whose image it is, the focus is a lot on, well, did they really mean it? Did they want to share it? Was it a joke? To, you know, mm. did, you know, was it done like as a like just like a, out of anger? Mm -hmm. So the focus is so much on the perpetrators uh, rather than thinking about well, this person didn't consent to it to being shared. Like, what about their like power and agency in that situation? So that's kind of like how so consent is a dynamic concept, and I think that's the best way to think about it. And and that's why informed consent is so important because getting someone to sign a paper is not. Like, yes, technically you have informed them of their rights and they have signed it and they, you have legal like consent. <laughs> But is it really informed? Like, do they really understand what's in it? So we are trialing in Chen, we do video consent forms as well as, as text-based consent forms because some people will just like glaze over like forms, especially if there's someone who might have literacy issues, might have attention deficit or are just sick of signing forms and they're just, just going to sign it. So we attach a video to kind of prompt them to watch that video just in case. Also gives them a human face to kind of hold accountable if they have to. So, um, yeah, so there's lots of ideas on, on like figuring out how we get informed consent. Uh, consent is such a central issue in feminist theory as well. So I'm wondering, like, how does informed consent maybe also connect to the sustainability or the field that you're working in, right? Like, imagine not only having the pop-ups and I hope there will be a better way for like your data is being used in this and that way. Also having to like opt into like how much, um, 
how environmentally unfriendly the use of a certain technology is, right? Yeah. You know, I, before this panel, I hadn't thought about the role of consent in climate, but I'm wondering, put your hands up, how many of you consented to our future being burned away? <laughs> I mean, they didn't. They didn't get. They didn't get your consent. Did they, you know, so it's like there's a there is a gap between where we're headed in terms of you know emissions and include specific, you know the internet's use um, fossil fuels, but just generally the society that we we have democratic mechanisms to express our our intent or our wishes and preferences, but that is like not enough for the crisis that we're in. And so, what are the ways that we can um, express our dissent or? Or, I mean, there, there are many other modes of like um, civil action that we could take, but I do think, I, I don't know if maybe you all have worked on consent in other situations, but I think it could be quite interesting to think about, yeah, evolving that into, into a climate context. Um, yeah, which is thinking and yeah, yeah, brainstorming. Yeah, we, we, we were hallway yeah. brainstorming. And, and do you have some thoughts on the, on the consent uh, things that we just discussed? Or something to add? On the consent, I think I, I've just been thinking on on the climate side, for example, that like making making visible sort of the, the, I think in in one way, like I'm just trying to imagine, like if you use the the fast the fast movie or the move you download the movie with the highest quality, you make so much so much pollution. Like it's on the one hand yes and on the uh, the uh, the only thing that my critique would be is that it starts with the um, the consumer and that overall so, sort of like i absolutely agree with consent as a feminist principle but in terms of a solution to the climate crisis i think we always have like rather look at the struct the big political yeah, structure totally. i think we, we agree on that one and so i'm i'm just fearing that this will again be used to put, you, you know, to say, you can choose consumer between the good internet and the bad internet, while all the internet has to be mm -hmm. green, you know? And it's not like me buying the fair-traded bananas or the non-fair-traded bananas, but there shouldn't be any mar bananas on the market where, which have... Um, Yeah, where, where people have had forced labor or not being not being able to organize th these kind of things. So, I think um, consent on um, in I see it as something more in a personal interpersonal realm, and um, I'm wondering whether at the at the larger perspective, it's the the concept that well, how 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 far can it take us? It's sort of my question to it. Yeah. And you see, now we're getting. <laughs> Now the conversation is starting, but we just saw the five minutes left uh, mm. sign until uh, questions from the audience, um, which is a shame, but will be around for, for long at Republica. Um, but we've been speaking about like the visions and the heritage and the ideas that we are all inspired by. So I was wondering if you wanted to share, like, who are you inspired by when you work doing your work, the tough work as an activist, as a community organizer, as a researcher? Um, what works or ideas inspire you, Ellen? Yeah, I think you are a big inspiration. Um, so you <laughs> yeah, yes, you yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, I have to say, I have to say, as a fund, so I work for Robert Bosch Foundation, and a lot of what we do is to fund the people that in whose work we believe, and it's for good reason that we funded the tech uh, feminist tech, the work on the feminist tech principles and on orbit. So this is really great work, and there are. Um, other organizations that either we the digital freedom fund for example has embarked on a process to decolonialize the digital rights field which again i think is something which i think is interesting because it a acknowledges um colonial history and colonialism also as something that is baked into um, an intersection perspective and where they also try to link social movements with people working in the digital rights field and bringing these two fights together. Um, and so I think that would be one other thing I would like to reference. And um, another person who, who shared some of her 
um, worked with us lately was Roshana Wittloren, who has an organization for Sintitze in Germany that um, also establishes an online a safe space, as their organization is called, for um, the Sinti community, but other um, marginalized communities as well. And I think it's really important to create these spaces to and not let the internet you know, being taken over by these behemoths that we've been talking about earlier. Was that the Romani Pen Archive that you're talking about? Um, that's a bit uh, different. It's also um, a Sint, uh, like a Sint Titsi who has started it. It's called Safe Spaces. Safe Spaces. Space. And the first project, the Decolizing, uh, Decolonializing Digital Rights, is by Nani Jansen Revendlov, who also just started Systemic Justice, a nonprofit in the space. So if you want to write down this stuff and do some research, uh, these are the, the names to like look for. Hera, what about you? Who's your inspiration? I'll focus on people, you know, um, who are around right now and who have been a source of inspiration mm -hmm. for me. So I started Chen uh, nine years ago. And at that time, what was really inspiring for me was Harass Map, which was one of the, the world's first, uh, you know, mapping of sexual harassment in Egypt. And I was so inspired by that project. And that's like one of the reasons I started Chen, because I was like, well, wow, like, you know, I can do something. And also my very close friend, uh, Nigadad, who is always a source of inspiration for me. You should all follow her work. She uh, does a lot of work on privacy uh, and data rights and gender-based violence in Pakistan, where I'm from and I grew up. And I feel like Nigadad, does the kind of work that Chen does, but in an incredibly difficult setting. You know, even though it's my country, I could not do the work that I do right now had I not been in the UK. So, uh, and she does it there. So it's like every time I feel like I struggle with something, I think of her and I'm like, wow, she's doing it there. You know, I can do this. It gives me like a lot of power. Um, so yeah, definitely follow her. What about you, Michelle? Um, well, I wanted to shout out um, Adrienne Marie Brown, who's an uh, organizer in Detroit, and you featured her in, uh, on, in the um, Ding magazine, and she talks about um, community organizing as science fiction, and the idea that in order to bring people together to work collectively on issues, you have to, you have to be kind of almost a science fiction writer to help imagine those visions and bring them to life. Um, and so I find her approach really inspiring, and also the way she is as a whole person in her activism. If you're familiar with her work, she also has done things like whole, she lives her life in the spirit of um, pleasure activism. Like I'm going to have the maximum amount of pleasure in my life. And as like also a form of a, ra a radical act. Um, and also an investment in the idea of like emergence theory and the fact that, you know, bringing people in the room as whole humans is going to, result in like an emergence that is stronger than any of us individually. And so I really respect her work and um, have learned a lot from that. And also appreciate, as you were talking about earlier, the way that she and many others who, who have been you know, here at Republica and working on things have openly documented what they're doing, what they're learning, what they're trying. And I feel like that's such a practice to really celebrate. That really comes also from the open movement, but also feminist practices to talk about what's hard, what sucks, <laughs> um, where the barriers still are. And that kind of honesty and reflection is... And so thank you, any, everyone in this room who's done things like that and contributed to our you know, shared knowledge. And the open is a good segue into opening up for audience questions. <laughs> um, I'd like to collect three questions, or like at first three questions, and then we'll answer them, and then we'll see if we have time for more questions. So, ah, yeah, there's one. Can I start? Yeah. Hi. Um, <coughs> thank you very much for this panel. I really enjoyed it. And I do have a question when it comes to like sort of disseminating the ideas or also the concepts of feminist tech, because I really do believe that it is sort of more than just design principles, for example. I mean, you were talking about hope, and I think that is a value that is so um, really diametral, <laughs> like in a diametral point of the field, if we look at values of like capitalist corporate corporations and so i was wondering like if like what is your approach in your work is it like okay we're gonna have a very thought through approach in our work in our organizations and just hope that these organizations will grow or are you also like looking for collaborations with corporations that are not necessarily, or like obviously not feminist, and then having like the danger of being tokenized or instrumentalized. 
Thank you. Hi. Uh, thank you for this panel. It's very interesting. Um, I have the question about, I don't know if it, if it fits or if it has been said already, but um, how we can use tech to also involve men into the discussion, especially when it comes to gender-based uh, gender violence, because as we know, it's a feminist issue, but it's a men problem and not a women problem because we are not the issue here. Um, mm. So how can we use tech to involve men into calling it, not calling each other out, but just saying, you know, uh, mm -hmm. don't hurt women. <laughs> not how can we women uh, be safe or tell each other how to be safe because you're not the issue. This is probably a question for Hera, right? Okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. Hi, thanks. I'm sorry, my voice is a little um, weird right now. It's a question mainly for, for Hera. Um, thanks. Um, can, can you think of things that the digital realm, whatever that may mean, can draw from survivors of domestic, sexual, and gender-based violence? How, and that, how do you envision that being applied to tech solutions, like the one you have proposed, mm -hmm. and to the entire panel. Um, can you think of, I don't know if I'm the only one here thinking, oh my God, I, I will never be able to do all of these wonderful things. <laughs> But I'm going to challenge that and ask, can you throw starting points for us out there? Uh, and I don't, I don't know that everybody needs to be like a full-time activist, um, but like also thinking of consistency in everyday life. Where can one start? Where can we push this forward in small actions? Thank you. Thank you. Why don't we start with the last question? Maybe the first one. The um, question about. Um, uh, hmm? Starting points, yeah. Who wants to go for it? Shall I start? start you with start with the starting points. points. Okay. Um, thank you for this beautiful question. And um, one other um, feminist that I'm indebted to is Audre Lorde, who says, speak, because if you don't speak, your anger won't be heard. So I think you're absolutely right that, um, and it also connects to agency that we've mentioned. And I think it's one of the essential things is to speak up and to do it together with others. I'm always hesitant to say where one should get active because I think there are really a lot of great organizations out there and everyone has different time slots available for activism and different, um, different capacities that you want to bring in. But I think the important thing is to be active together with others because these are problems we cannot solve by ourselves and also the experience of changing something in communion with others it's like it connects to the pleasure activism that you mentioned i love it it's like the, the pleasure of having achieved something together with others i think is incomparable to doing things alone and i think this is also what then drives further engagement and even if it's frustrating at times you'll also be there to hold each other if you can't achieve the success you've been looking for and so it's just yeah find find the right find one organization and if it's not for you then try another one i'm sure you'll find one and um so it's get started it would be mine i'll be quick uh, i would say use your power read Sight, listen, open your mind, vote correctly, volunteer, <laughs> donate, have challenging conversations, and always be learning. Motto, there we go. <laughs> I get asked all the time. <laughs>
Yeah, there's not, I would, but I do think this idea of not being alone is important. Um, I felt that myself being in the digital rights space and going, am I the only one caring about the, you know, the, and I, I know I wasn't, but actually just saying that out loud at the lunch table and in meetings, it was actually made me realize, oh, my colleagues that are sitting across from me, they care too. And then that sense of connection, like we don't know the answers, but we actually care about these things made us feel we realized the power that we had in our organization and we actually started to organize. And um, so I do think speaking out, even, even in the, you know, with friends about concerns you have, you might find that a sense of solidarity you didn't realize was there. Thanks. Then we had the question about how can we use tech to involve, bring man into the discussion? We, I mean, look, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Violence against women is a male issue. It's not a women's issue. Uh, patriarchy is a, is a male issue. It hurts men to, you know, we bring up men in extremely toxic situations. They have far too much power and entitlement. And when you have title in, title, entitlement, power and privilege, you are often blind to it. So it's no wonder that men end up acting in the most horrible ways and then are unable to comprehend when you're confronted by it. So I think we need to raise better men. Uh, and that is, a, that, that is a role for everybody to play in it. Uh, but secondly, the tech world already is male dominated. So actually, we don't have to bring men into anything. They got to step up. So like, you know, who are your developers? Who, are, who is your CTO? Who, you know, who are the funders? Who are the like regulators? There are men everywhere. So really, we don't have to bring in anybody. They have to bring themselves in. They don't actually have to bring themselves in either. They're already there. They need to bring us in. They need to step up and use their power. So, you know, everybody here has power. And like my message is always like, use your power, grow your power, share your power. And men can absolutely do that. And like, you know, I'm happy to see some male faces here, like vis visibly male faces here. And I think it's good that people are coming to these discuss discussions, but really what we need is action. So, you know, don't treat people like shit. Grow up <laughs> and, you know, use your power. <laughs> I hope I noted the last question correctly. If not, then, then help me, please. Um, so it's about dissemination um, and the approach um, that you take in your work when it comes to dissemination, but also working with uh, corporations and how do you navigate not being tokenized? I wanted to uh, to cite an amazing um, indigenous and open science scholar called Dr. Uh, Max the Byron, who talks about feminist tech in compromised spaces. They are amazing. Th their work also, um, Pollutionist Colonialism, is also amazing. And they talked about there's no activism that is not compromised. We live in patriarchy, we live in capitalism, we live in you know, white supremacy, heteronormative, you know, we live in all that. Um, and so every action you take as an activist will necessarily replicate some of that system we're in. So there's like an acknowledgement of imperfection um, that we will always carry that kind of compromise with us even as we go for change. That's not necessarily about where and how to work with corporations, but that helped me feel like I didn't have to get in a purity battle with myself or with others, that it's just, we're always going to be have those compromises and how do you still make the most of it acknowledging that? I could not agree more. Um, I feel like this question gets asked all the time and it's, it's a good question to ask and I think it's a good conversation we should be asking of ourselves all the time. But there's so much work to do. There's just so much work to do and there's so much power held by very few like, you know, pockets of the world. We cannot afford not to engage with them. We just have to keep our principles like, you know, you know, in mind and make sure that we're not tokenized. There's not like, there's no greenwashing, but I absolutely am a firm believer in engaging with powerful like power holders, irrespective of what they are and who they are. I just think there needs to be some engagement. Some civil society organizations need to fight them. Some need to work from the inside. Like we need all kinds of players and we should not be shaming like people for what position they take. If the goal is the same, we need like, you know, lobbyists. Like I, I am fundamentally against about lobbying, but the amount of good work that lobbyists sometimes do to get progressive legislation in place, like, you know, great. Like, you know, I, I don't, I want a world with no lobbyists, but if they're getting good, you know, I don't want to be lobbyists, but I'm very grateful when they get like, you know, progressive legislation in. So I, I take a very pragmatic approach at this. I think the, um, I, I share the, what you've said. And I think that the question of getting to good, I think like in my previous job at Oxfam, they, 
they work with organizations and also ask like how, how can we hold them to accountable or what are the maybe what are the steps that we really need to see so it's not greenwashing so it's not tokenism so and i think it's absolutely right to approach them and at the same time to think about okay but what are the things that really have to come out for us so that are signs that we can really say these are signs of a real engagement and a real interest in change. And I think the, the other question you had was on disseminating feminist um, ideas in technology. And I, I think, yeah, it's it's an event like this. And it's it's also a call um, to to all of you, all of us that, that work in, in the sector to, to take that with you and to to claim that space. And I think one of the things that Julia said in the beginning, feminists have always been there in the spaces and it's a question of power and like claiming them more actively for us. No one else will do it for us, so we have to do it ourselves. Thank you. And by that, we're out of time. I hope every one of you is taking away one or two thoughts on how to move towards and build more just and equal futures in tech, but also far beyond. Thank you so much for your questions and thanks so much for the fabulous, fabulous Ellen, Hera and Michelle. Thank you. Thank you.